Good afternoon. Uh, dear Chairman, thank you for the introduction. So I am here in my quality of pathology. And what I'm going to do with you for 20 minutes is just uh, to present a summary of gastric cancer. It's pure morphology, so don't be afraid. It's a kind of revision for, as a kind of introduction for what we'll have afterwards. So if I can summarize for you, gastric cancer can be, uh, uh, can be described, does this work? Okay. Can be described in two major groups. It is a group of sporadic gastric cancer accounting for something like 90% of the cases. 10% of the cases present in a familial setting, and it's a small proportion of cases that uh, uh, correspond to hereditary cancer. We'll approach these two groups, and for the better understanding of all these settings, there are contributions from pathology, molecular pathology, and genetic susceptibility. It is my purpose today to focus only in, on pathology. And to begin with, you all know that gastric cancer in most countries, and Japan is an exception, because there is a screening program for gastric cancer there. But in most cancers, gastric cancer, most ca uh, countries, gastric cancer do, does not show, as I'm showing here, which I'm referring to early gastric cancer. You know very well this entity corresponds to the cases in which the tumor developed only in the mucosa and submucosa, not reaching the muscularis propria. And there is a classification of the different types of early gastric cancer. This is essential endoscopic classification and the different types of tumors can be easily recognized by the endoscopists. This would be a protruding type. This would be a flat, slightly elevated. This would be excavated. And the endoscopists use for the better characterization many times chromoendoscopy, which facilitates the identification. We have a lot of experience in these days in our hospital in early gastric cancer because one of the endoscopists working there is an expert in uh, uh, endoscopic resection techniques, so we are uh, these days quite experienced in this. Unfortunately, in my country, in Portugal, I'm afraid also in Spain and many other countries, gastric cancer presents as an advanced disease, and this is one of the classifications of advanced gastric cancer the so-called Kodama classification, which distinguish different types of tumor polyps, which are rare, uh, fungating as the one I'm showing you, corresponding to a large majority of cases. Also, some, ty some types which are excavated or those which are widely infiltrative, corresponding to the signet ring or diffuse type. But now we'll move to histopathology and, and to the classification of gastric cancer. What I'm showing you now is the classification of the World Health Classification Organization, and this was the classification published in the year 2000. By that time, there were four main types of gastric cancer that were recognized, papular, tubular, mucinous, and signet ring cell carcinoma, and the different features you know very well. Uh, but the problem was, by that time, and uh, in the recent years and still these days, the problem of the designation of signet ring cell carcinoma, and I will detail a bit why, and also the existence, yes or not, of a specific type of gastric cancer that we could designate it as mixed gastric carcinoma. Let's begin by the signet ring cell carcinomas. Despite this terminology has been used in WHO classification for years, the problem is that mostly in sporadic cases, when we have what we would call a signet ring cell carcinoma, rarely would display the typical features of signet ring cells. On the contrary, many cases display different features, such as this one, in which the neoplastic cells look bizarre and do not display at all the signet ring cell phenotype. Many times the neoplastic cells are very small and invading cords or tubercle and do not have the features of the signet ring cell phenotype. Still, some of the cases, there is a very intensive desmoplastic reaction in the stroma. So looking at these three examples of the so-called signet ring cell phenotype, you would agree with me that it is difficult for a morphologist to call any of these cases as a signet ring cell carcinoma. So for the most recent classification, WHO classification of gastric cancer, it was proposed to, to, to change the designation for these tumors for something that is now designated as poorly coercive carcinoma. 
What is the problem then with the so-called mixed carcinomas? Do they exist or not? We do think they exist. They correspond to the tumors in which you recognize not only a tubular papular component, but also a poorly cohesive component. And when you search for the expression of ecadrin, for instance, which is a cell adhesion molecule, you can see that in the glandular tubular component there is expression at the cell membrane, which is lost in the area of the tumor composed by poorly cohesive cells. We searched in a study performed a couple of years, mutations of ecadrin gene, and could demonstrate that in these tumors, the poorly cohesive component, they do have mutations, somatic mutations of the CDH1 gene encoding for ecadrin, which are almost absent in the glandular component. So with this evidence, we came to the conclusion that when we have these mixed tumors, it means that there was a mutation occurring in a tumor previously with a glandular structure that led to the occurrence of a new component composed by isolated poorly cohesive cells. More recently, we had the opportunity to study these cases separating the poorly cohesive component from the glandular component and performing CDH studies, and we have shown that the chromosomal changes in each of the components is very similar. This shows us that these tumors originally are monoclonal and the two phenotypes derive from the occurrence of the mutation in CDH1 gene. This was our experience and other molecular events have also been described by other authors. Is this relevant or not? We do think it is relevant. It is relevant for morphology, it is relevant also for prognosis because we are aware that the patients are harboring gastric carcinoma of the mixed type. They have a much worse prognosis uh, evaluated in terms of five-year survival rate. The problem is, what is the impact of this morphology for something that you may be interested in, which is for therapeutics? And for this purpose, it is not very well uh, elucidated for the moment. So, and uh, these changes regarding the impact in the prognosis have also been confirmed by different series in the East, just consolidating the existence of this uh, specific type. So putting together all these new findings regarding the morphology for the new classification of the WHO book, in which participate a large group of experts from all over the world, from the United States, from Japan, from Australia. We came up with a new classification of gastric cancer in which now you recognize papular tubular, you are aware of very well, mucinous adenocarcinomas, and now there is this category of poorly cohesive carcinomas. If by chance the tumor has a pure signet ring cell phenotype, you can call signet ring cell carcinoma. Otherwise, it should be designated only by poorly cohesive carcinoma, not otherwise specified. So for those of you who are not well aware of this classification, please do not blame on your pathologists if they begin to report as poorly cohesive carcinomas for this type of tumors. And now it is well recognized in WHO classification, the last edition published in 2010, the mixed carcinoma of the stomach because there's a specific behavior. We cannot forget when we talk about morphology, about histopathology of the so-called Lorenz classification, which is the most widely used when you think about epidemiological approach, epidemiological studies. And for this type of classification, you know there are two major types, the so-called intestinal and the so-called diffuse. This corresponding in WHO to tubular papillary, this corresponding in WHO classification to poorly cohesive. They are distinct in morphology, very different. They behave differently. This type occurs mainly in elder patients, and uh, it is decreasing the incidence all over the world and gives rise to metastases which are blood-borne, giving metastases in the liver mainly. This is different from what you get in diffuse carcinoma, you, uh, corresponding, as I mentioned, to poorly cohesive, because it occurs more in young patients, mainly females, and disseminates more to the peritoneum. <clears throat> and we have to, to be aware, and this is something which is an announcement for the future, and maybe the next WHO classification will encompass this new perspective. I will have the opportunity to discuss tomorrow the, 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 new, uh, the new incomes regarding this perspective, which is this one. It is now well known that when you have a tumor in gastric cancer that has a glandular structure, tubular or papillary, you can have different cell differentiations. 
In some cases, we have gastric differentiation, while other tumors have pure intestinal type differentiation. This is very important for carcinogenesis. I would like to have time to discuss this today with you, which is not the case. Those of you who will attend the session tomorrow will learn more about. For the moment, however, WHO is not considering this new knowledge as determining a different approach in the classification of gastric cancer. If you move now to hereditary cancer, there is also in the new WHO book in 2010 a new chapter on hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, an entity that is now very well characterized, encompassing for something like 1% of all gastric cancers, and most of these tumors are caused by the Ecadrine gene mutations, different types, I'll discuss tomorrow also. And the criteria for identification of this syndrome are well established. Criteria 1 and criteria 2 are similar to the criteria the so-called Amsterdam used for Lynch syndrome. What I want to bring to your attention is that there are two new criteria you should be aware of. And the first is that you should test for e mutations whenever you have a diagnosis of diffuse type gastric cancer made in a patient who is 20 years or younger. This is compulsory these days. The other criterion is for families in which you have the diagnosis of both diffuse cancer and lobular breast cancer, these patients should also be tested for e gene mutations because they can be carriers, despite having not these first criteria that were originally described. What we see at the microscope in this setting, yes, the cells, they have the, the, the bona fide features of signet ring cell uh, carcinoma. And this is an example of intermucosal signet ring cell carcinoma of the hereditary type. And what is relevant in this setting is that it is now well known that our precursor lesions of this invasive hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. And this is new because this is well known in the hereditary setting and it is not well elucidated in the sporadic setting. We are using these days the search of these intraepithelial lesions which are in situ carcinoma and parstoid spread for the endoscopies that are uh, performed in the patients who refuse to be submitted to prophylactic hysterectomies. And this is extremely relevant because the detection can determine the timing of the prophylactic hysterectomy. Taking in consideration all this knowledge, we came a couple of years ago to a model of development of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, just emphasizing that from a, a mucosa with hyperplastic changes, we have intraepithelial in situ, we have partial spread of signet ring cells, and at the end, we have intermucosal carcinoma. The problem with this syndrome is that these early lesions can stay in the patients for years. Nobody knows for how long. It seems that they are indolent for a while, and nobody knows what happens at a certain time point in which there is a change, there is an epithelium zinchemal transition, and these tumors become extremely aggressive and can kill the patients in a couple of months. That's why the recommendation of prophylactic hysterectomy is well settled these days. The other syndrome, which is hereditary in the stomach, is the so-called gap syndrome, can be new for some of you. This is a syndrome that is by morphology very typical, is characterized by hundreds of polyps affecting the proximal stomach of the patients. These are three stomachs from patients in the same family submitted to prophylactic hysterectomies. And the interesting thing about these polyps is that these polyps have the features not of adenomatous polyps, but these are fundic gland polyps. I, I don't know if you can see, yes. These are fundic gland polyps roundish in which you have cystic changes. And what is interesting, because all of you are aware of fundic gland polyps so frequent in the population, but in this setting, which is hereditary, they can coexist with hyperplastic polyps, also with adenomatous polyps, and even more interesting, they, the fundic gland polyps, they can exhibit full collisions of dysplasia. And in these families, besides the occurrence of displacing the gastric polyps of fundic type, what is relevant is the occurrence of gastric carcinoma. And it is now known that there is an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance in this disease. And the criteria for identification of this new syndrome is the occurrence of hundreds of polyps restricted to the body and the fundus of the stomach. Of course, you clinicians should exclude the existence of colorectal or duodenal polyps. These polyps are more than 100 carpeting the proximal stomach. They are 
predominant fundi gland polyps, some in having areas of dysplasia, and some patients develop gastric cancer. And this is really relevant. This led to the publication of this new syndrome, which is now published in gut. What we are searching now is for the genetic basis of this new syndrome, which has not been elucidated yet. After this publication, a couple of months afterwards, there was another publication from Japan describing two families exactly with the same features, uh, fundi gland polyps with a bona fide phenotype with dysplasia and development of gastric cancer. We approached the authors of this, uh, of this paper to join efforts for the identification of the genes, but they prefer to go separately. I think they do hope to find the gene before then our group will be able to do. So coming up as a kind of summary of what I said regarding familial gastric cancer, if you don't have the criteria for hereditary, you are facing familial aggregation about 10% of the cases. And what is new and is relevant and in a way compensates for the efforts made in this field is that in the hereditary cancer we knew already of a diffuse type and we now we have gastric adenocarcinoma with glandular structure constituting the hereditary intestinal type of gastric cancer. And this is all. Thank you so much for your attention.